All right, hello everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. Today we're very happy to have Marta Piropan talking mm -hmm. about the split torsor method for Manin's conjecture. This is part of a series of talks on Manin's conjecture and rational points. And if you remember from last time, we're starting to have, uh, we'd like to have a little more of an interactive discussion at the end of the talk. And at also a few times that Marta may indicate uh, during the talk. So, you know, think about questions you might wanna ask and feel free to put those in the chat or, um, or ask them at an appropriate time. Uh, so Marta, is it all right for us to video your talk today? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Great, okay, we'll go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation to give a talk in this series. Uh, it's very interesting and very nice to see <clears throat> some, uh, some research about Manning's conjecture going on during pandemic times, actually. So uh, I guess you cannot really see this very much because you're seeing my slides, but here is a, a nice reminder of the last big meeting about rational points I've been before pandemic. It was the trimester in Paris um, two summers ago. Um, today we are together to talk about Manning's conjectures. Manning's conjectures concern uh, asymptotics uh, for counts of points of bounded height, usually. And what I want to talk today is the Manning's conjecture, like the classical one, and one of the approaches to uh, try to solve it in some special cases, which is called the split torso method. So we want to consider points of bounded height. So first, let's recall together what is the height. So the first thing to remember is that uh, if we have a set of integers of bounded size, then this is always going to be a finite set, just by definition. And so using this, uh, this factor, then one can look at this first height that we have, the very height, which is going to be defined for points of the projective space over the rational numbers, for example. And then we take a, a point uh, with some representative and then we define the world height in full generality as this product of all the places of Q, Q considered as a number field, of we are taking product of maxima of uh, absolute values of the coordinates of our point. Now, we know, probably all of us know that uh, if we take special representatives for these uh, coordinates, uh, so we take uh, integers that are co-prime, then we can uh, transform this product uh, into just uh, one of its uh, factors, which is uh, the maximum of the absolute values with respect to the usual absolute value for the real numbers. And now, if we look at this, it is immediate that uh, the set of points with coordinates that are integers plus this uh, condition on the greatest common divisor, it's a subset of the set that we had above. And so if we consider points of the projective space of veil hat bounded by some bound B, then this is always going to be a finite set. This is the starting point for me for why do we want to count points of bounded height? We do have the cardinalities of set like this plus extra conditions added on top and we want to understand what is this cardinality and usually we cannot really say what the cardinality is in this very specific example we can but in more complicated cases we cannot so the best we can do is try to understand asymptotics when we let the bound vary for example go to infinity so this is the classical bay height and this was the height for the projective space of a Q, and we can define it similarly if we just have some number field. So our K is going to be a number field uh, throughout the talk, and then we can define the bell height uh, just in the very same way by taking the product of, over all the places of the number field. And it has the very same property that if we take uh, points of the projective space of bell height bounded by B, then we get the final set. So we can compute, try to compute the cardinality. This is the Northcote property for heights. 
And all the heights that we want to consider have this property. All right, so what can we say more about heights? These are heights for the projective space. I want to talk about heights for various types of varieties. So the next piece of information that we want to understand is height for varieties. And the slogan is heights are defined by line bundles. So if you're familiar with heights, so you probably already know this. Otherwise, here is how it goes. If we take some variety X, for example, inside some projective space, if it is a projective variety, we can do it. Then, of course, instead of counting points of the projective space of bounded height, we can count just the points that lie inside of X. It's going to be a subset, so we still get a funny set. Great. Uh, but then the question is, is this some, somehow intrinsic to X, to the variety X? And this is not the case because this depends on the type of embedding that we choose. So this height that I wrote here is really actually the height after composing with this embedding that one has, let's call it phi. And so really we can define different heights on X if we choose uh, different embeddings. And usually we can choose different embeddings. Okay, so this is what I mean when I say that heights are defined by line bundles. Because heights depend on the chosen embedding, then we know from algebraic geometry that embeddings are defined by global sections of certain ample line bundles. And once we're given the embedding, this line bundle is just a pullback of the uh, very ample line bundle of one of the projective space. So if we want to define a height, we need this kind of embedding. And if we want to define an embedding, we need an ample line bundle with some sections. Uh, of course, one would have to be more precise about this. So I'm not going to be precise. So I'm just going to use ample uh, in quotation, which means positive enough so that this is well defined. You can think of very ample for just for simplicity if you want. So really an embedding, but uh, something which is big enough suffices to define heights. And we're talking about heights that have this North code property. So the set of points of height bounded by some bound is always finite. All right, so this is essentially about heights. Um, I wonder, does anybody have any questions about heights? It sounds great. So if not, uh, I guess that we can continue. And the next piece of information that we have from uh, algebraic geometry is that uh, all varieties come with uh, a special line bundle, which is called the canonical line bundle. And of course, they also come with the dual of this line bundle because all line bundles have a dual. And this is called the anti-canonical line bundle. Then since all varieties have such line bundles, we can ask ourselves, can we use the lines, these line bundles to define heights? And if the canonical line bundle is ample, then yes, we can do it. And if the anti-canonical line bundle is ample, then we can do it with that one. Uh, we are going to be interested only in the case where the anti-canonical line bundle is ample. This is the case where the variety we look at is a fun variety. It is really just defined by this property. And the reason why we want to consider only this case is because for Manning's conjecture, we're interested in asymptotics for uh, counts of points of bounded height. And this makes sense only if we have uh, plenty of points to work with. And we have a conjecture that says if the canonical line bundle is ample, then we have a variety of general type uh, and the set of points is supposed to be contained in a proper subvariety. In particular, we are not really uh, going to see a behavior that depends on the whole variety. Manus conjecture is not for these kind of varieties. In particular, if you think about curves, for example, uh, then we would have only finitely many points to counter, and this is not what we need for an asymptotic. So we are going to want to ask always that our variety, which will be Fano, has a dense set 
of rational points. Okay, so we come to the conjecture. Maybe, maybe some of you has, has seen this conjecture before. So this is the most recent uh, statement of the conjecture that we have. The conjecture was stated first uh, by oh, first by Manning in a paper in collaboration with uh, uh, Frankie and Shinko. And the original conjecture is slightly different. I'm going to explain it in a moment. But then, as you see here, there is a list of names. And I am possibly even forgetting some of the names of the people who have been involved in refining this conjecture and making it more precise. So first, we certainly have Manin and Batyrev and Pear that we'll see in a moment and Schinkel. And also, I, will, I want to mention already, these four people have certainly contributed to understanding the subtleties of this conjecture. So Chambaloir, his PhD student, Cécile Rodelier, and Shota Nimoto and uh, uh, Brian Neyman for most, the most recent papers. What is this conjecture? So it's a conjecture about asymptotics for points of bounded height. We are going to work with Fano varieties. And just to make it more general and also as precise as possible, I'm going to call this varieties of Fano type. But you can think of Fano varieties. And this is because I want to assume them to be smooth so that the statement goes through nicely. So we start with one such smooth variety of Fano type defined over some number field. This is the first, first two ingredients. Then we have one to define a height. And to define the height, we need a line bundle. So we take a line bundle which is positive enough, for example, an ample line bundle. Then the next thing that we want to, to make this conjecture make sense is asking that uh, the set of rational points is very risky dense in my variety. If it is not, then we don't expect anything like this asymptotic formula, which is in the conjecture to hold. Then the conjecture says the following. There exists a thin set, which is as a subset of the set of rational points, such that the following asymptotic formula holds when we count points of bounded height. So we are going to count points in X but not inside the thin subset Z. So we allow ourselves to just remove such a thin subset. And then we're going to look at such points when they have height at most P. And if we look at this as a function of P and then we like take the uh, variable B equal to infinity, then the conjecture says this is going to be asymptotic to uh, a constant C. Well, let's write like this C which is going to be a positive constant. And then we get a power of the bound B and the power of the logarithm of the bound. And these two powers, these two exponents, A and B, are given geometric invariants of X. So they are very explicit and computable. If you give me X, I can compute who these two numbers are. The constant also has a very precise and explicit description. And uh, the, well, the first, but also I would say the main descriptions about the constant are due to pair. And this, uh, and this was done uh, a few years after the conjecture was first stated. So before going to the history of this conjecture, I would like to explain what is a thin set because it appears here and uh, maybe not everybody is uh, familiar with it. So here it comes. So we get, the, we get the precise definition. A thin set is going to be uh, a subset of the set of rational points, Z. And we say that such a subset is seen if it is contained in a finite union of two types of things sub varieties of X or, or together with 
images of generically finite maps of degree at least two. So what does it mean? So variety, uh, I hope we all know. And for a generically finite map, it means that it has to be a map, a morphism from some variety Y to some variety X, and it doesn't have to be variational. Otherwise, we risk throwing away all points on, on X. So the example here, the classical example is just, okay, the set of points in a projective line where all the both coordinates are squares, or you can do this in a projective space if you wish. Then this is the image of a map from P1 to P1, which is just raising the coordinates to squares. It's a well-defined morphism. The image of a rational point is a rational point. And uh, the set of the images, so this set here, is an example of a thin set. So the very nice example is think of raising coordinates to powers. All right. So this is the conjecture. Are there any questions about the statement so far? Can I ask a question about the hypothesis that X of K is risky dense? Yes. I was wondering, is, is it expected that if, if, if you assume only that X has a K point, is that, is that enough to, that you would still expect that these, all these conclusions? This is a great question. I don't know. I wish I knew. Okay, but there are no, uh, no so examples. There are no counterexamples. There are that. no counterexamples. That's the point. I I wish uh, anybody would have such an example or a proof that uh, if a final variety or rationally connected variety has a rational point over a number field, then the set of rational points is a risky dense. But we don't have a proof and we don't have a counterexample. Yeah, we know we know it for the petal surfaces in most cases. And so dimension one and two, essentially. Yeah. And, so, um, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, maybe I missed it, but uh, I, you defined uh, Fano uh, varieties, but what do you mean precisely with Fano type varieties? Oh, I didn't define it and I'm, I'm not going to, but I mean, if you want, you can think of the anti-canonical line bundle um, here to be big enough. Or you take the anti-canonical line bundle and you subtract something positive and then okay. you get something ample. So, okay, thanks. yeah. I was wondering, why do you want to take the anti-canonical line bundle in the conjecture? Of course, as you said, for curves, it doesn't make sense, but say for surfaces, why, why is it a good, is there any intuition? What do you mean? Why do we want to use the anti-canonical line bundle to count points? I'm not uh, asking here to take the anti-canonical line bundle to count points. I just say that L is some ample line bundle on X, and then of course, oh, and, and then the exponents A and B in the asymptotic formula will depend on the choice of L. So I didn't discuss the geometric invariants and I, I'm not, I, I don't plan to go into details about them nor about the constant, but A and B are defined uh, using X and, and L. Maybe I could actually write it here. Oh, sorry, thank you, right, my mistake. Yeah. So the classical very first, uh, um, the very first formulation of Einstein's conjecture was for the anti-canonical line bundle, who is a very which is a very natural uh, ample line bundle to use to define a height for final varieties. And so, yeah, that was the case. But this is uh, what I think is the most general formulation of the conjecture. Modulo the details of the constant and the exponents, which I did not define precisely. All right, so if there are no other questions about the statement, of course, you can ask later as well. There's uh, one, one question. Uh, there's one in the chat. Oh, there's a question in the chat, please. I'm going to look at it. So uh, the question says, you said that we have the degree, degree bigger than one hypothesis to avoid throwing out all rational points. True. Uh, is it known that XK is not thin under the hypothesis of the conjecture? 
meaning you can get all rational points from a higher degree finite map. This is a great question indeed. I guess that I should have been more precise here. So let's add this. Yeah, we don't know it. Uh, we expect it and we don't have a counter example in this case either. But uh, yeah, thanks Bianca for this, uh, for making this precise. So we want uh, that the set of rational point is the risky dense in X and not thin itself. So not contained in a finite union of sub varieties or uh, images of uh, generically finite maps of degree at least two. Thank you. Yeah, this was a lot. So now I'm going to scroll down. If you need to go back to the conjecture on the website of Vantage, you can find uh, a copy of this uh, of these notes that I'm using right now. So if you need to go back for details, feel free to just download a copy which is there. So maybe it's easy, easier to follow. All right, so yeah, I wanted to say something about the history of this conjecture. Uh, those of you who are familiar with it, uh, uh, you know it already. Uh, it's more for finishing the introductory part uh, and, uh, and for the people who are not so familiar with it. So here we go. The first two results in this direction, by which I mean asymptotic formulas for rational points of bounded height, are by Birch and Shanwell. Birch in 62 with the circle metal for hypersurfaces in the projective space and over the rational numbers. And then by Shanwell for the projective space over the um, over arbitrary number fields. And the conjecture was uh, formulated the first time in the 80s and the paper by Frank Manin and Schinkel appeared in 89. And that's the first uh, uh, instance of the conjecture we have in that case, then the line bundle, which is used is just the anti-canonical line bundle of a smooth final variety. And also the restriction on the set that we can, we have to allow ourselves to throw away the set set. It was not uh, uh, supposed to be a thin set, but just uh, a closed subset, points on a closed sub variety. In that paper, you also find uh, the proof for the case of flag varieties and plenty of properties of Manning's conjecture and whether it holds, if it holds for two varieties, it holds for the pro fiber product and, and things like this. Then the, the thing that I wrote in blue here are the improvement of the conjecture, improvements of the conjecture essentially. So we have a paper by Baturev and Manning where just immediately after the conjecture was stated for the anti-canonical line bundle, it was clear that it was possible to use heights for other line bundles as well. And so why not, why don't we uh, formulate a conjecture? So uh, maybe it's not really stated as a conjecture, but in this paper, which I think is very important, you find the first uh, um, discussions about these things and the first uh, uh, considerations uh, and uh, essentially uh, the right prediction for the exponent A, the first exponent in the conjecture which is discussed here. And then right after people started looking at this conjecture. This conjecture was very exciting. And of course here, you don't, you don't find here in my list, uh, the whole bibliography, the whole bibli bibli bibliography about Manus conjecture is huge. Uh, but these are kind of the most important papers. And one of the fundamental papers we have about Manus conjecture is by Pear in the Duke Journal. And that's the paper where he gives a conjecture for the constant, the constant, which is a product of local densities plus some other invariants of the variety and the number field. And then at the same time, there was this discovery that the conjecture is not true. So there is a counterexample 
more pre most precisely to the fact that that if there are any points in the variety that affect the counting by changing the asymptotic formula into something which is different and usually means that the asymptote becomes bigger, the number A and B the exponents become bigger than predicted or now we also look at the example when the exponents are the right exponents but the constant is bigger than expected. And so the points that contribute to this extra amount are called uh, points that lie in accumulated subsets and the idea is uh, in the when the conjecture was formulated is that uh, that uh, such accumulated subsets were just uh, containing some closed subsets but they're not because we have at least this first one counter example that says that indeed they can be contained into a thin set but nevertheless this didn't stop anybody so we have plenty of paper from then on and there were so many paper and this was so interesting that uh, then we have this one asterisk volume in 1998, uh, which is only about minus conjecture essentially and asymptotics for points of bounded height. So anybody who works on minus conjecture should own a copy of this, of this asterisk volume. Uh, very many, many, many important papers are there inside. And I don't think if now, asterisks are available online, but when I started working on this, they were not. And so usually you have, you have to go to the library to find it. Okay. Anyway, inside this paper, there is one particular, uh, one particular, uh, oh, inside this book, sorry, there is one particular paper by Salberger, where he proves Manning's conjecture for toric varieties over Q, over the rational numbers, using a method that uses universal torsors for toric varieties. This is not the first in instance of uh, uh, a paper that uses torsors to count points. The first paper by Beach was using torsors in its own way. Also the paper by Shanwell was using torsors in its own way. This paper by Salberger is maybe not the first, but the first paper who does a, a big uh, work on uh, explaining the role of torsors uh, into, into this case. I think that torsors are already mentioned somewhere in Payer's paper from 95. So Salberger's, I would say, is probably the first paper that theorizes using torsors for counting points for Manning's conjecture. And, and from now on, I'm only listing papers that give uh, either uh, very important contribution to the development of the conjecture or that are important for this universal torso method or split torso method, depending on how you want to call it. And the reason is, is that the literature is just so vast. Around NTA, there were very many important papers that started proving the conjecture for, for example, compactifications of uh, certain uh, um, algebraic groups uh, using the height zeta function, which is another very important method. And I think that there will be a talk by Schinkel about this or hopefully about this uh, during this series. So you will have the opportunity to see um, also hopefully the literature about this uh, in, the, in that case. All right, so how about torsors? Here I just made some list of papers. It's not, uh, um, it, it, it's not complete, obviously. Uh, we have uh, some important paper by Pear in 2001 on universal torsos and the circle method. I would say it's like the next big chunk of examples of uh, where Manning's conjecture is proved to, proven to hold using these, these torsos. And then here there is one, this is not a paper, this is a, a PhD thesis of Ulrich Derenthal. Ulrich uh, Derenthal was my PhD advisor. So for me, the story about minus conjecture by universal torso, my personal story starts here, when Derenthal, student of Trinko, wrote the PhD thesis about the universal torsos, how to compute these torsos using cox rings and how to use this to, um, to prove Manning's conjecture in specific example, especially the pets of surfaces. 
another groundbreaking paper that uses torsos uh, and the universal torsos method for Manning's conjecture is this paper 2012 by Delabretesh, Browning, and Pear. Oh, I forgot all the accents here. Oh, at least one here. Um, so this is a paper about Chatelet surfaces. Uh, if you want to study torsos and the universal torso method, this is also a fundamental paper to look into. And then, and then here, now we get uh, one paper, which is not about torsos. This is a paper where the first example of which I know of a case of Manis conjecture, which is proven by throwing away a thin subset of the set of rational points is proven. So this is a very important paper because from before we see already from 96, uh, we know that there can be counterexamples, but nobody has their counting points outside of a thin set. And then I have here then another couple of papers uh, about the universal torsion method and another couple of papers here. Again, and in between, there is this paper by Brian Lehman and Shota Nimoto from 2017, which to me kind of culminates the, all the efforts in giving the most possible refined definition of Manning's conjecture, a version of the conjecture that doesn't have a counterexample. And this is a conjecture where the study of the thin subset that we have to throw away is also quite thorough and there is some sort of prediction of what this thin set should be. Okay, so for what concerns uh, the results that I'm interested in for today's talk, uh, if you want to look at the literature, you will find them in this paper by Derental and Fry first. So there's one thing that we have to say, the universal torso method, you can look at this list. Uh, if you look at the paper, you see it more precisely. It has been used only for varieties over the rational numbers until somebody has tried to do it over number fits that are not the rational numbers. And so I guess that this one is possibly the, the very first paper after Shanwell's paper which is about number fields and still uses this kind of method. So this is for varieties over imaginary, uh, well, over Q of I. So it is, it is a totally imaginary uh, quadratic field. And then we have a couple of other papers where I contributed as well. So one paper where we have a uh, an example where we can, we can apply the universal torso method for varieties over arbitrary number fields. And then finally, another paper now in collaboration with uh, Ulrich Derental, where we use the split torso method over arbitrary number fields. So what does it mean? We have, we have universal torsos here and here. We have split torsos here. We also have this other paper in between, which is about split torsos and cox rings. This is a, a paper about algebraic geometry of torsos and relations to cox rings. It's in the list of, of uh, references in case you're interested in it, but it doesn't talk very much about minus conjecture. Though we have some examples of how to apply the theory to uh, minus conjecture. And so the main point is that there is these torsos that I'm going to define in a moment are some objects and there's plenty of them. And there is one special one, which is called the universal torso, which is the one that has been used uh, since the beginning when people started using torsos for rational points, it looks like it is the best one to use. And this works reasonably well for varieties where the Picard group has uh, no non-trivial action of the absolute Galois group of the number field where the variety is defined over. But, and so we call also, sometimes we call these split varieties, so they have nothing to do with split varieties with another meaning of being split. 
So varieties where the Picard group is split with respect to the action of the Galois group. And there, these universal torsos work very well. And so what happens in this paper in collaboration with Christopher Fry, we look at the one del pezzo surface of degree four, and we prove minus conjecture for this one del pezzo surface of degree four defined over an arbitrary number field. But then there are also other uh, forms of the same del pezzo surface of degree four. So the pezzo surfaces of degree four over a number field that are isomorphic to the given one when we extend scalars to the algebraic closure. And for those, the paper that we wrote don't apply, doesn't apply, because they are not split in the sense the Picard group has a non-trivial action of the Galois group. And so to treat those other cases, we have to um, improve the method, if you want, or uh, generalize the method. And this is what we mean when we say we will use the split torso method. It is to treat also varieties where there is a non-trivial action of the absolute Galois group on the Picard group. And so in this last paper, we prove for all possible forms of that given variety, which was already considered in this paper in collaboration with Christopher Fry, which uh, accidentally it's also the same variety which was considered in the previous paper. All right, so this is so uh, this history. Uh, this is my version of the history for the split torso method. Uh, I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who wishes to ask questions or to add something about this, because of course this is not a complete story. Well, I see that there has been also discussion in the chat, which is very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe we can continue. And the next topic is Cox rings. Because I want to tell you at least what this split or some method is. And so I'm going to try to connect with what we have said before about heights. Heights are defined by line bundles and their global sections. And Cox rings, very loosely speaking, can be thought of the ring of global sections of all line bundles of the variety. So a Cox ring is a ring attached to a given variety and it really contains all sections of all line bundles, meaning choices for each isomorphism class. So to make this a little bit more concrete, because I, I don't want to go into the actual definition, here is an example. Uh, the example that everybody does is the projective space. And that's a great example. Uh, but I wanted to do a slightly different example. So here is the second favorite example. It is the quadric, which is a quadric surface, which is also uh, isomorphic to P1 times P1. So we look at this. P1 times P1, we coordinate x0, x1 in the first uh, factor and y0, y1 in the second factor. And then we look at line bundles on, on P1 times P1. They correspond to uh, couples of integers A and B, which corresponds to an O of one from the first factor and an O of one from the second factor, and then we pull back under the projections and there we get our line bundle and all line bundles have this shape. So line bundles corresponds to numbers in Z2 and Z2 is also isomorphic to the Picard group of this surface. And now if we look in terms of this coordinate, we can describe global sections of a line bundle O of AB are just by homogeneous polynomials of by degree A for the coordinates X and B for the coordinates Y. So for example, if we take O of two comma one, then this would be one global section. It has degree two in the, in the coordinates axis and degree one in the coordinates Y. 
And then the Cox ring of P1 times P1 is supposed to be the ring of all global sections of all line bundles. It is actually the ring generated by all global sections of all line bundles. And so in this case, it is isomorphic to just the polynomial ring in four variables, and the four variables corresponds to the four coordinates on P1 times P1. And these x0, x1 are the only well, are a basis of the global sections of O of 1, 0, and Y0, Y1 is a basis of the global sections of O of 0, 1. So, and this already generates everything. So this is an example. Uh, small parentheses, all toric varieties have Cox rings that are polynomial rings. And this one is one such example. And if you look at the usual projective space, then the Cox ring is just the coordinate ring of the projective space. So here are two reasons why you should be interested in Cox rings. The first reason is that they really contain all the sections of all line bundles, meaning if you want, if you have an explicit description of your Cox ring, then hopefully you also can get an explicit description of all possible heights just by using elements of your Cox ring and taking absolute values and taking products of maximum of absolute values, just like in the definition of the paid height. So this makes the height very concrete. And then the other property, which is the most important property actually for the split torso method is the second one. If the Cox ring is finitely generated, which means finitely generated as a K algebra, like in this example, it's a polynomial ring in four, in four variables, then I can describe the split torso of the variety X by using the Cox ring. And this is always the case for final varieties. It's not true for arbitrary varieties but it is true for final varieties. And well, it's actually a much larger, much larger class. All right. So are there any questions about Cox rings? It sounds good. All right, so we go to the last part. Well, I guess maybe what you are waiting for. The split torso method. What is this and how does it work? So small recap, we work with final varieties. So we really work in the setting of Manus conjecture. And then there are these two properties that we have about final varieties. The Picard group is a finitely generated free group. So we will always write it isomorphic to a free group of rank R. And then the Cox ring is finally generated as I said. And so we just write down some explicit representation of the Cox ring as a, a K algebra finally generated. So a quotient of a polynomial ring. And if we have this description, then we can try to understand the, the torso the split torso of this variety. The first thing that we do is we look at an affine space whose coordinate corresponds to the variable that define my presentation of the Cox ring. And then I'm going to look inside of it uh, as the sub variety, which is defined just by the equations that define my Cox ring. This is the spectrum of the Cox ring, if you want to think in terms of algebraic geometry. And this is a close sub variety of my affine space. But this is not going to be the object that I want to work with. I want to take an open subset there inside. So I will have some, actually, we can always choose these uh, uh, polynomials to be monomials. And we can find here inside them. Um, this one open subset 
which has the special property that it comes uh, with the amorphism down to x, the variety we started with. And this morphism ends up being a g m to the r torsor, so a torsor under a group, uh, uh, a multiplicative group. Okay, let's see if I if I manage to do this. And the point is that here the exponent r is the same r as uh, the rank of the Picard group. This this one g m to the r is the dual of the Picard group z to the r. So this is a construction that we can always do. And the point is, how are we going to use this to count points? This is the picture that we get over, over the number field. And then in order to use this effectively to count points, the idea is to use uh, the new variety y, the torso, to parameterize the points of x and then somehow lift the, pro the problem of counting points on x to a problem of counting points on y. And the reason why we want to do this is because if we are able to find suitable integral models, integral models of x, of y, inside, which respect this embedding into an affine space. So here we go. If we, if we get such um, integral models over the ring of integers of the number field, such that then this model remains a torsor, then we can use the information as follows. Instead of counting point on x, we want to count point on, points on y. And we want to, to do this by using the explicit description of y's as a subset of this affine space, uh, as a subset uh, 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 by which I mean that it is going to be defined by some polynomials, equal, equalities and inequalities, just like this. And, uh, and possibly they are not going to be the same polynomials that we started with because we are going to take integral mode and it's a very delicate thing to do. But the reason why this is useful is because uh, then we have this one descri explicit description of the set of now integral points on Y as a subset of OK to the N, which is going to be a lattice inside the vector space, the vector space that we obtain when we take products of all completions of the number field K at infinite places. And we just have a free product of this OK and times. Counting lattice points is something that people know how to do, or at least in very nice cases. It is a very difficult problem in general, but it is a doable problem. Counting points with coordinates in, a, in a just a, in, um, in, in a number field, in principle, it's just we, we don't know how to start if we want to just really count them one, one, one by one or one after the other. There are other methods that can, that can be used without going through this uh, integral model. But uh, if we want to really use the techniques uh, of analytic number theory for counting lattice points, then we can use this um, framework to try to apply it to our case. And the reason why it works uh, is that torsors, these torsors have very nice properties. The first property is that they subject onto rational points. So if we look at x and we look at the rational points over the algebraic closure of our number field, then we take one torso just like in this construction, and then the map from the rational points on the torso to the rational points on the variety is going to be subjected. Now we're going to do the same over our number field. And then we ask ourselves, if we take, if we take y of k rational points on y, and then we send them down using this torsor map, which I called pi to x, is this subjective? No, this is not subjective in general, but 
we have a way to describe uh, a set of classes of torsors that all together are going to subject. And those, those, those torsors, which are the ones that are uh, described here, they're all twists of the one, one of the, well, we choose one of them, construct the first one of them. And then there is a, a choice of twists that we can take so that uh, if we take the union, the disjoint union over such, and then we map down to X, then the images of these, the images of these, uh, of these uh, points on torsos are going to have, well, are going to cover X. That's the first thing. So we do have subjectiveness here. And also uh, each torso is going to uh, map into a different set on X. So these disjoint images of this disjoint union so images of these uh, twists are going to be disjoint from each other in X. This is one very important property because then we can look at X as a disjoint union of images of rational points from such torsors. And, and then we're going to say, okay, then the rational points of X are in bijection with the fibers of these maps. And the fibers of these maps are going to be all isomorphic to the group G and to the R because these maps are all torsors. So what does torsor mean? It means that it is a special map with the property, among others, that uh, all fibers or all rational points are going to be isomorphic to G and to the R. So it's really a vibration where all the fibers are isomorphic. And so counting fibers is the same as counting points on the target. So what we get is a bijection between the fibers and XK. And now the other thing about these torsos is that this G M to the R, this group has an action here on Y uh, inside the fibers. And so what one can what one can really write down is a bijection between the rational points on Y modulo the action of these fibers that are GM to the R into the rational points of X. This is a little bit technical. But but this is a very good thing because now we have the points of on X and and we want to relay the rational points on X with integral points on the torsors. So the first thing to do is to take this integral model and take this integral model to be proper or projective if you want, over OK. So if the integral model is proper, then we do have an equality between rational points on X and integral points on the model. And then by the same discussions as before, we can write down the integral points on this model as this disjoint union of orbits of points on, twist, on, on twists of Y under the action of this group. Oh. And the group is G M to the R integral points on this group. And the integral points on this group are just uh, R copies of the unit of the ring of integers of the number 5k. So we are essentially at the end. This is the big description of the split torso machinery. Now that we have this description, then we're going to look at two different cases. How are we going to use this? We want to count a set of points on x of height at most b. And we end up saying, OK, points on x is the same as integral points on the model, which is the same as orbits under the action of this group. So we're going to distinguish two cases. The first case, if this group is finite, for example, if k is uh, the rational numbers or an imaginary quadratic number field. Then counting points on all y or counting points up to the action 
of a finite group is going to be the same up to the cardinality of this group, or if you want, up to the cardinality of the fibers of the vibration we started with. And so counting points on X is going to be the same up to the cardinality of the group that X there, which is a finite group, is going to be a sum over all the twists of just counting points of bounded height on the torso. If the unit of the ring of integers of the number field and don't, uh, don't form a finite group, so if this is an infinite group, then we cannot do this. And this is the reason why the split torsor method, the universal torsor method has been used mostly over the rational numbers, because then we are always in the first case. And so it is, we do have, we know that we do have this kind of equality and we really just need to count points on the torso. If we have an action of an infinite group instead here, then instead of dividing by a cardinality, we really have to look for a fundamental domain for the action of this infinite group. And this is much more complicated. And the main reason is because such a fundamental domain is not going to be an algebraic object. It's going to be defined, for example, by exponentials or logarithms. And uh, the way that we solved this in the joint paper with Christopher Fry was by using all minimality techniques for counting lattice points in domains that are defined by algebraic conditions, but also by conditions involving the exponential function. All right, so this is the end of my talk. I expect that you may have many questions, so feel free to ask them. Thank you, Marta. That was a wonderful talk.